two of them, were, I mean, brothers, I'm, I'm the oldest of four brothers. So one brother sympathized with me that, that much uh, good has been done by Muslims in America, and the other two of them say they're not sure. So even in my own family, I, I can't say I've won the, the battle, but I keep trying. Yes, it's very hard to be very crisp because the shoes involved are too many. Uh, but nonetheless, I'll, my question will have two parts. One would be, uh, given the American foreign policy's obsessions in the post-Cold War period, particularly about the Middle East, remaking of the Muslim world and things like that, and Islamophobia and so on. Now, these uh, obsessions of American foreign policy, don't you think the perennial tension uh, creator for the immigrants, Muslim immigrants in the United States and uh, the American state. You know that the Muslims have been overshadowed. They have been shadowed by the intelligence agencies. They have faced many problems and so on. Uh, that's the background. So uh, American foreign policy obsessions, unless they change, especially Gaza and what has happened in Gaza now, uh, unless they change, uh, there would be a perennial, perennial source of tension. Yeah. The second part is, in place of clash of civilizations, are there efforts to promote dialogue of, between civilizations in the United States? Instead of clash of civilization thesis, clash of civilizations, have, have there been attempts to promote dialogue between civilizations, especially between the Christians and the Muslims? Thank you for both those questions. Let me, let me answer the, the first one by saying um, that I have, um, I have very strong views on Gaza. But instead of spending time telling you what my views are, let me tell you one of my Palestinian students. And all I do is give you her name, and you can look up her blog. Her name is Rania, R-A-N-I-A, Rania Masri, M-A-S-R-I. So if you just, when you have a chance after this, and uh, it was a speech that she gave maybe about two weeks ago where every single thing that's been reported about Gaza in the media and every single charge made either by the United States government or Israel, she has refuted systematically. Including the whole pretext for the Gaza war. I mean, it, it is a huge, huge issue beyond what I could easily say. But my own view is closer to my, she's a former student of mine, but even if, if I disagreed with her, I'd tell you, but I actually agree with her. But it's a long, it's 50 minutes. And she goes through all of the lead up, all of the incidents, all of the Israeli invasions of the last five years, and the way in which American government has either been complicitous or uh, explicitly supportive of what Israel's done. So I think this is, yes, obviously I support this view that it is not something that's been positive, either for Gaza or for the American image in the larger Muslim world. So, I can't change it, and I disagree with it. I have opposed it. I've written about it. I've talked about it. But my own student, who happens to be Palestinian, and who has some family, but not our family, Gaza, some of them are also in West Bank. And I will just say one thing. One of the major arguments she makes is to say that it's very false to separate the Palestinians from the Gazans, as if they are a, there is a separate place, but they're not a separate um, tradition or legacy or history. And the whole has to be seen in order to figure out what to do next. Now, uh, on your, uh, your your second question was about the, the, the clash versus the, 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 the uh, alternative. The clash. Um, my, my whole career, my, my whole uh, career since going back to the mid-70s, uh, so for the last uh, 40 years, my whole career has been built on the fact that there is not a clash, but a convergence, or at least a compatibility of civilizations, not just Islam in the West, but also Indian, Chinese, ancient, and modern. Um, my life's work is built around um, an American scholar who died back in the 60s named Marshall Hodson. And his view, uh, the venture of Islam, was that you cannot understand world history without Islam. Islam is both the parts of the world that are African and Asian are majority Muslim, but Islam has influenced the whole history of the world. So instead of saying clash of civilizations, you only have one civilization that's global, and Islam is part of it. I think you have to start with that premise. If you start with the premise and say, oh, I'm for complementarity, convergence, a 
alliance of civilization, there's always the possibility there's divergence, opposition, enmity. I think as soon as you binarize, dichotomize, separate, well, I, my own view is that there is one humanity and there's one civilization and Islam has been a major, not the only, but a major participant, agent, for good and for bad, but I would say mostly for good, and we could argue about whether it's good or bad, but it's not because there's a separate thing called the Muslim world and the rest of the world, it's because there's one world and there's a single Muslim entity that plays it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Shuja Uddin from University of Hyderabad. I'm working on Muslim migration up to 9-11 to America. So my first question is, uh, uh, so is my confusion, if you can clarify this. Uh, where shall we trace back to the, uh, you know, the so-called Muslim migration to America? Because we know, uh, is, I don't feel comfortable while using this tag Muslim migration, putting all African-Americans and Arab-Americans and South Asian-American Muslims into one tag. Because uh, Muslims exist before the arrival of Columbus in America. When Columbus reached there, he saw the mosque there and he wanted his son to be uh, one of imams, means that's a respected person in that area. So uh, how, how, how can we, how, what are the yardstick for this Muslim migration or the Muslim migrants? I, I feel that uh, our argument, we will. Our, our argument by talking about this Muslim migration can be, and spe specifically should be traced back to the 1965 migration. After that, we have to look at. And what earlier migration we had to America from uh, African continent, that should be considered as, uh, you know, uh, uh, earliest, you know, settlers of America. Uh, as we know that all, uh, America is not, uh, Today, it might be country, but it's all about colony of colonies. So, uh, so how will you feel, you know, my argument? Uh, I don't feel comfortable with this argument called Muslim migrants putting all, you know, African Americans and Arab Americans and South, and, uh, South Asian Americans into one tag or Muslim migrants. How do you feel about it, sir? Well, I, my, my, my first feeling is that um, my lecture was too short or inadequate if you understood my thesis to be that the immigrants are somehow separate from American life and that I am denying that there were other patterns and people who came to America, including those who came um, and displaced the American Indians who were the real original uh, inhabitants of the United States. And of course, they were not called uh, Indians. That was a name that was put in them by Columbus because he thought he was discovering this place, mm -hmm. India. The reason we have Indians in America is because Columbus made a mistake in name. So I am, uh, I am what's called a revisionist historian who takes de Tocqueville as my first point of stop. I, I actually, this happened in a, in a lecture I gave earlier today where I said my own view of American history is it starts with de Tocqueville who said America needs frontiers. The people who came in, and Columbus and the, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the French, and also of course the British who came and discover, discovered, discovered, meaning they, they themselves uh, became part of a new uh, group that settled in America only to mine its resources and send it back to Europe. These European colonialists, who were the first ones that settled America, were initially from the southern part of the Mediterranean. That is to say, they were, they were Spanish, they were Portuguese, but then they became Dutch, British, Scots, French, and of course also Germans. All these people who came in the second uh, European migration, I didn't talk about in this lecture because my topic was going to be Muslim okay. immigrants. And that I didn't mean to say that this was like the first and only immigrants. The whole United States, unless you take the Mormons, I don't, by the way, take the Mormons, unless you take the Mormons as your point of reference when they said the Vikings came over 2,000 years ago, and they, the Mormons, are just the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints because they've always been there for 2,000 years. Unless you take the Mormon view of history, those people who are Anglo-Americans, like myself, came over only from the 17th century on, and they displaced, and in fact, through disease and warfare, killed the real Americans, or the first Americans, who were Indians. And I've talked about this and written about this extensively elsewhere. But today, I was just taking the small slice that says what happened in the 20th century when these people who claim America 
And by the way, they're not my distant ancestors. My father, my, my own um, origin is European, not American. My father was Hungarian. And he only came to America because they had a potato famine in Hungary in the 1880s, 1890s. And his father couldn't make a living for his kids. So he migrated from outside of, of Budapest, Hungary, to Buffalo, New York. And my father was a very reluctant American. He, he always wanted to go back to Europe but then there was never enough of a job or opportunity. So there were some Americans, including my own immediate family, who came to this place or that place, that other place, reluctantly, and never really left their strong feeling, their affection, and their legacy in Europe. So I'm not an America first or saying, oh, it's just this country that's all pure white, and everybody who's white is the same and they're all Americans, and these other people who came who are Asian, who are brown, or African, or black, they're not the real Americans. If they speak Spanish, they're not really... The, the, the latest of the clash of civilizations in America, to answer the previous question, doesn't come about from Asian, or even from European, but comes from the Spanish immigrants. So the people who disagree with me, and there are plenty who disagree with me, say, oh, Spanish immigrants should learn English or leave America. Learn it or leave it. Instead of love it or leave it, they say learn it, meaning English, or leave it. So there are many people who take a false view that America is only white. It belongs only to a small group of people who come from Protestant, mostly Christian, but even more Protestant background. But I think that's a false view, and I don't support it either in history <coughs> or in practice. Thank you. It's a question, and a personal question, if you don't mind about it. No, I don't mind particular uh, questions. Uh, in spite of your erudition and so much of scholarship in Islam, did you feel at any time of your service since last 30 years to convert to a Muslim? Oh, many times. Did you get this idea that I become a Muslim? <laughs> so, got the answer. I think the question you're answering is, why, the... did, why did I do the next answer? Well, actually, Professor Nizami, whom I mentioned earlier. Next question, yes. Professor Nizami has said to me, you know something, you could become a Muslim and we would all be very happy, but you can do a much better job as a Christian who advocates right, Islam. Right, 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 right. <laughs> right, right. So many of my family think I'm already practicing taqiyya, that I am secretly Muslim. <laughs> so that's, that's another answer, but that's a longer question. Good, good, good. good. Yes. Very Sir, good. good evening, brothers. I'm yeah. Abu Jihad. Uh, uh, I belong from Mike American Kari Translation. Kari I'm Abu Jihad, Ayubi. I belong from I mean, translation studies. Uh, my question is, sir, uh, what is the condition of Islam in America? Uh, uh, meanings? Uh, there is no band. Uh, there is no band any Islamic uh, religious book and promulgate to make something widely known. Any Islamic religious book. Any Islamic research book? Yeah, yeah, religious book. Religious book. book. Religious book. Religious book. I know this, and I know it very well, because some of the work that I do when I'm not a scholar, even though I've written a lot of books and given too many speeches and traveled to too many uh, professional meetings, when I do what I love to do, I work with people who are handicapped or um, marginal to American society. And many of these people are in prison. So I, I work with prisoners. And unfortunately, there's a disproportionate. There are more prisoners who are Muslim than not among the African Americans, the people who are African American. And so one of the things that has happened is that after 9-11, certain translations of the Quran are now prohibited from, from prison. And I will tell you why. Because the, uh, I, I think you may know this version of the Quran. It's called the Khan, Khan and Hilali. Muhammad Ali and Mohsin Khan that came out from uh, Saudi Arabia. Do you know this? Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the standard large translations of the Quran in English. But unfortunately, it has in the very, it's now been retracted, but the, uh, it's no longer the official translation from Saudi Arabia, but it has been given out for so long that it's in most homes. When I used to go to Saudi Arabia, it always would be beside my bed. The, the, the Hilali, Hilali Khan translation of the Quran. The thing it does is it doesn't give a translation of the Quran, it interprets in, in parentheses what it means. So, um, 
when it comes to Maghdubi alayhim waladalin, I don't want to go through the whole thing, but when just in Surah Al Fatiha, when you have the last two, with the last verse, Maghdubi alayhim waladalin, I'm sure you know this, so you have to know this or you're not a Muslim. So, the one, those on whom God is angry and those who have not gone astray. It says in the Khan Khalili, those on whom God is angry, the Jews. Those who have gone astray, the Christians. Well, you know, if you have this as, a, as the opening verse of the Quran, it's very hard to have conversation with people who are Jews and Christians. But Tabari, Tabari, who is a very well-known scholar, most people think he understood the Quran and history very well, even though he's Persian, but he learned Arabic very good at a young age. Tabari says, it's impossible this could have been referred to Jews and Christians. Why? Because when it was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, it was around 614. It was very early in his, in, in, in his, in his prophecy that the Fatiha was revealed to him. Some people say it was as early as 612. It doesn't matter. It was well before the Hijra, and it was only with the Hijra in 622 that you began to have Muslims having to define themselves more carefully against Christians, not against, against Jewish groups that did not join Islam. But in the beginning, Islam was open, not only to pagans, but also to Jews and Christians. So why would the Surah Al-Fatiha, which is the opening of the Quran, and the announcement of its blessing for all humankind, say at the very beginning, sorry Jews, you didn't make it. Sorry Christians, you're not included. So that's a simple answer to your question, is that, that, that there, most books are not prohibited, but that particular translation of the Quran after 9-11, because it was deemed to be hateful literature. But other translations, and they're very good translations, Pikthaw, we've talked about Pikthaw every day, um, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, uh, there are several others, all of which you can find, and none of which is prohibited in America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. question and answer session. Now, I'm with the Adab and Ahtiram. Naim Sheikh Al-Jamiyam, Dr. Khwaja Muhammad Shahid Sahib, Shahid Sahib, I'm going to ask all of you to give us a prayer to our prayer. Professor Lawrence, Head of the department, Madam Dean, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm really delighted to be present here this evening, this afternoon, to hear a very informative lecture from Professor Lawrence. Also a very interesting question and answer session, which showed a very and a very deep interest in the affairs of American Muslims by the audience sitting in this hall. The lecture, of course, I had many things to our knowledge. That, of course, threw light to many areas which we did not know before this afternoon. The interest of Muslims world over in America are no, even those who are not Muslim in, a, in, a, in, in American affairs is well established, well known. It's one of the leading countries of the world, America at present, particularly after the fall of the bipolar polity, international polity, fall of the Cold War, America is playing a leading role in the world affairs. And the interest which we all carry in the American affairs is undoubtedly much, much more than it used to be 50 years back or 40 years back. Particularly, when you talk about in American Muslims, our interest as a Muslim is aroused, much more aroused. How they are facing situation, how they are facing challenges, and you have particularly talked about 9-11 and consequent wars in Africa and in, in Afghanistan and in Iraq and so and so forth. All these events, all of us world over are affected and we would like to know, we wanted to know, we are anxious to know how American Muslims are adjusting to these situations. We may have many lessons to learn from American Muslims, how they are facing this situation, how they are interacting uh, with the community, which may or may not be hostile, which may or may be accommodative or may not be accommodative. I do not know. There may be perhaps more such talks are required 
an authority like Professor Lawrence is a, is a very befitting speaker to speak on all these topics. So I, on behalf of my own university, on my own behalf, on, my, on behalf of the head of the department, thank him, thank him that he visited us and talked on such an important topic. Uh, I hope the department continues its tradition and organize more and more uh, such lectures. A uh, few interesting things which I have uh, definitely would like to highlight, if I understood correctly, and interestingly about the Turkish scholar, Muslim scholar which you mentioned, Professor Lawrence, what was his name? Uh, Muhtada Khan. Khan. I really like that he has a knack to make fun of himself. It's, it's a very difficult to find a Muslim scholar who can make some fun out of his uh, knowledge or out of his wisdom. Mostly Muslim scholars remain very serious and very grumpy. Now here is a scholar who can make fun of himself. I think there are lessons to learn from this uh, point which he mentioned. We, have made, we should not make our religion or religious studies so difficult. And of course he has mentioned some of the translation we just mentioned and make it so serious and so difficult for others to understand and appreciate or come closer to us. Come closer to us, come nearer to us to appreciate our point of view. We miss, we, our, our, our message, our mission should be, if I am allowed to use, should be slightly more in a more open arm method. We should not start, uh, we should not start, again I am reluctant to use certain words, uh, we should not start closing our communication with other groups, other communities, whether they are Christians or Jews or in our case in Indian context they are Hindus, other communities. So the whole approach should be reaching out whole approach should be all encompassing, whole approach should be to taking others along with us instead of rather not reaching out and closing ourselves and telling them others are, as he said, left out, Jews are left out, Christians are not left out and so and so are left out. This is what I feel whether as a community, Muslim as a community or as a religion, Islam as a religion should and should and must do to reach out and initially, in all its initial phases,